I have a rule, actually, that I developed back when I was an academic, which is that if a student asked for my time, I always gave them the time. I actually thought it was horrible. You'd hear these other professors say, but just a bad student is just the worst thing. And I'm like, well, there isn't a bad student. They're just students. It's your job to figure out how to make a difference in their lives. Uh, you know, it's interesting, the difference between my life and my father's. I grew up in coastal California. I've got a lot of fancy smancy degrees. Um, I've gotten the chance to build a bunch of companies and be an academic at some very fancy universities, all of which I love. Um, but nowadays, this whole mad scientist thing. So people bring me problems. Uh, some of them my team come up with internally. Some of them are just an email. Dr. Ming, uh, my daughter has 500 seizures a day. Please save her life. Or uh, a very recent one, Dr. Ming, my son can't enter REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. That may not sound major, but generally speaking, people that can't enter REM sleep die of congestive stress-related heart failure fairly quickly. Um, please save his life. Or our company can't figure out how to retain black women. Or Dr. Ming, the Secretary General of the UN, has no idea what to do about global AI policy. Can you help? And our answer is that if we think we can make a unique contribution to people's lives, I pay for everything. And we go in, and our team tries to come up with a solution. And we don't always. Nobody knows what's wrong with this kid with REM sleep. And I am not that kind of neuroscientist. I'm actually a theoretical neuroscientist, which if you'd never heard of that phrase before, just substitute the word lazy for theoretical. <laughs> we build fake brains on computers, and we teach them how to do things. And it was really cool. And who knew that you know, starting this 20 years ago, that suddenly artificial intelligence would become a transformational part of people's lives. I know it probably still doesn't feel that way, but trust me, just wait. Uh, so being able to make a difference is huge. And the reason I do this is partially because in some of the research I get to do nowadays through my philanthropy, we get to measure things like a sense of purpose. I know in this room and in a lot of education conferences, we're really worried about whether a kid knows how to factorize a polynomial. Uh, every major future of work policy paper that has almost ever come out, the White House has one, the World Economic Forum, uh, every major government, every think tank, uh, everybody has a future of work policy paper, they're all wrong. And I realize it is wildly arrogant for one crazy woman to think that all these very smart people are wrong. But if you come away with one thing from this talk, it's that I'm always right. Uh, so that's an important takeaway. It just saves a lot of time if we just get that off the table. Uh, but actually, it's really easy to understand. Uh, this is a symptom rather than a cause. Read any of those papers and look for the word person. None of them are about people. Turns out your students are endlessly fungible widgets that can just be changed to be anything that the economy needs, rather than human beings. You think that simply taking a person and teaching them a new skill, reskilling is the term uh, of art right now, is going to magically change their life? That's like saying, I'm going to take your Phillips screwdriver and give you a flathead. And now you're a different person. You're ready now for the 21st century. Um, that's ridiculous. I, I love a good tool. I think everyone should know how to factorize a polynomial. I was virtually an applied mathematician at one point in my life. But I'm not delusional. That's not what changes someone's life. The best salespeople in the world get the biggest bonuses. So we should give everyone giant bonuses. Uh, the people that go to university, earn vastly more and live better lives than people that don't. We must send everyone to university, teach everyone how to factorize a polynomial. Unfortunately, we're getting the causality all wrong. There's something much deeper going on in all of these stories. Turns out, the best salespeople in the world, you want to know where they differ from everyone else? When the incentives disappear. They're the only ones that keep selling. And that university that changes everyone's life Turns out you take the most elite performers and you don't send them to the university, and they have virtually the same life. How
how do we build that person? This idea of today's session about building a citizen for the future. How do we build a craftsman? How do we build a creative? How do we see every job as creative labor? Everything. Because I hate to break it to you, but jerks like me are building AIs. They're going to take everything else. I'm not building an AI. I literally am not building an AI to take a mid-skilled job. But the various tasks that make it up will slowly get automated away. All those specific tools that we focus so intently on in education and in hiring and in workforce will all slowly get automated to the point that why hire a highly educated person to do these jobs? I can hire someone that never graduated from high school and just have them be a pair of legs that walk this stuff around the office. We call this deprofessionalization, and it has been at work for a long time, and it's accelerating. What's left is what makes you different. I don't mean that as a wonderful philosophical self-help statement. I mean literally. What's left after people like me automate away all of the rote skills in the world is what makes you different. That is your value to the world. And I'm very quickly running out of time because it typically takes me two hours to introduce myself. But uh, how about this? Um, the last time I flew into Kansas City was probably about 40 years ago. Uh, my parents met at KU, so just in Lawrence over at some state, I forget the name, um, across uh, the border here. I'm sure you here in Missouri have a name for Kansas. Um, but uh, he grew up a sharecropper in southern Kansas. Uh, like, n nothing. This kid wasn't going to go anywhere. And after three years of high school, he graduated from the top of his class in the entire state. Again, you may not have the most charitable impression of the state of Kansas in your head, but nonetheless, this is an accomplishment. 1957, this kid off of a farm in nowhere, Kansas, Dorothy's never heard of this town, wrote an essay about how Israel would be the defining foreign policy issue in the world going forward. And he got a full scholarship everywhere. And he didn't go. Because what's the point? It's OK to be the smart kid on the farm. But why go to MIT just to end up back in Medicine Lodge or Hardner or Kiowa? He went to KU, met my mom. That's great for me, I guess. Uh, tutored Wilt Chamberlain in uh, chemistry, as it turns out, which is why Wilt Chamberlain is a famous chemist now. Um, <laughs> but he never felt that he lived up to his potential of who he could have been. Always lamented being a small town doctor. I'm sure all the people's lives he saved don't feel the same. I don't feel the same. But I know what he means. Roz Chetty, the famous Harvard economist, has written these papers that collectively people talk about lost Einsteins. My dad was a lost Einstein. And the thing is, kids not accepting scholarships to elite universities has been a known part of the American experience for 100 years. Normally, we're talking about black kids or Hispanic kids. Turns out a sharecropper's son is just the same. If you don't believe your hard work will pay off in this world, then why would you even try? He knew he could pass the classes. That wasn't the point. He could do the academics. Will my hard work pay off? Do I have a sense of purpose that there's something in this world that's bigger than me? Whether it's a spiritual purpose or not, I'm a very grounded humanist person myself. But there are these things that predict a better life these qualities about you. Some of them are things that we can't change. They're social justice issues. Your zip code is a huge predictor of your life outcomes. Um, but there are these others, some of which feel very intangible, like a sense of purpose or resilience, your ability to understand the perspectives of other people, your working memory span and attention, metacognition, creativity-related skills. This is what makes a craftsman. The rest is just tools. Craftsmen without their tools is hobbled. But tools without a craftsman is pointless. If you want to build a society, a civilization, we can never let an Einstein slip through our fingers again. Because the kid that's going to grow up 
and come up with a cure for the disease that will kill yours. That, that your child can't enter REM sleep. Um, that kid was just born in a favela in Rio, or in a village outside Kinshasa, or in a rough neighborhood in Kansas City, and they're never going to have the life that will make those outcomes possible. We have to understand the difference between taking a student into an academic institution and expecting them to complete tests and expecting them to deliver on demand the kind of formal uh, assessments that we put in front of them, when in fact the only thing I'm interested in is that we've built a better person. They'll figure the rest out. In our work, we call this meta-learning, the flashing light now saying, shut up, get off the stage. Um, we call this meta-learning, learning how to learn. And that's all that we do. Everything that I just said may sound, well, of course, but there's a difference between talking about a sense of purpose or resilience and actually having that being a part of curriculum. But uh, I will shut up in saying that these are all measurable. They are demonstrably, causally related to better life outcomes. And everything we look at in our work, about 50 constructs that all fall under these uh, rubric, they are provably intervenable. They are changeable. I'm not saying we don't teach people how to factor, factorize a polynomial. I'm saying that that is our delivery mechanism for how we teach them how to go out and plant a tree. Because the world gets better when old men plant trees. Even though they will never rest under its shade, turns out those old men lead better lives, provably better lives, because they made those sacrifices. How do you build a better citizen? Build someone that's willing to make a sacrifice for something that's bigger than them. And that's something we need to own in education. And to give you a sense of how crazy I am, I actually think that machine learning and artificial intelligence can help with that. We build these systems that can learn about a kid and say, hey, uh, mom, dad, foster mom, grandma, whoever it is that cares about this kid, you have 15 minutes free today. Here's the best way you could spend those 15 minutes. And we deliver via text message a little activity personalized for that kid in that moment that are meant to deliver an experience that rewires that kid's brain a tiny bit. No one experience is truly transformational, but a tiny bit over and over again, delivering these interventions. Are they the same for every kid? Well, I just said that they aren't. One kid needs one experience, another needs another. One kid is focusing on developing their sense of purpose, another is working on basic literacy and numeracy, again, a huge predictor of life outcomes. Can we flip the experience so we're delivering a unique educational experience, and not just in the classroom, how about in the workforce itself? What if jobs were an opportunity for growth? Not because an exceptional person can make them such, but in fact, by design. When you do the job, you will come out a better person. Peer role modeling is a huge effect. Stick a resilient person or two on a team that's working together for a couple of years, and at the other end, everybody on the team is more resilient. And this is a huge predictor, not just of education and economic outcomes. Turns out this wonderful research on entrepreneurs in West Africa showed that you could teach them about finance, or you could teach them about uh, you know, business school basics, and it doesn't change anything about the outcomes of their companies two years later. You give them a growth mindset intervention or resilience training, two years later, 60% more of their companies are still in business, bringing together a couple threads of the Kauffman Foundation here. Uh, this is what we can do. This is what I've decided to dedicate my life to doing. How can I rewire people's brains? Mad scientist. Turns out I actually literally get to jam things in people's brains sometimes and make them smarter. It's really cool. Um, any volunteers, I'm happy to take you. Uh, I'm afraid I can't make any guarantees about survival rates, but we appreciate your sacrifice. Um, but it turns out rich life experience in and of itself is the foundation of rewiring a brain, is the foundation of changing a life, and we've got to get out of our heads the 
point to change a life is not to take someone that's using spreadsheets and train them how to use SAP or Salesforce. Uh, it is not to take a worker in a factory and train them to work in another factory. Uh, how do we build someone that will go out tonight and make a sacrifice? That they will plant a tree. And I just told you one of the simplest things you could do is role modeling. The number one predictor of those kids that do take the scholarships from the hardest neighborhoods, from the most backwoods villages, someone from their neighborhood went before them. There's nothing as powerful as role modeling. I fiddle with my AI, but if we could build that, we can make it happen. Build a culture in your classrooms and in your schools and in your communities where we celebrate those role models. Where people understand that they can actually do this. Their hard work will pay off. It is amazing how well we communicate to kids that it won't. And they learn it. And then that's the end of who they could have been. Uh, I love factorizing polynomials. I love being an academic. But in the end, the future is about being human. Uh, because all the rest of it is going to get automated. We need to build a society of humans. And they need to believe that they can change the world. Thank you very much.